Hello, everyone. My name is Rose Kuwait Pasco, and you can call me Mix Rose. Today, I'd like to tell you a story about when I learned that I had a culture, that my family had a culture. Let me tell you about dinner time in my house, in my grandparents' house when I was young. When it was time for dinner, time for the one meal of the day where we all ate together at the table, there was a lot to experience. So before it was time to eat, the kitchen would be full of movement and teamwork. My relatives would be calling back and forth about what was ready and what wasn't ready, where to find more napkins or drinks, who should come through and grab this, which plastic tubs in the fridge weren't actually full of butter, but had mashed potatoes or pasta salad that needed to come out to the table. And if you weren't in a helping mood or you needed some quiet before dinner, that was always okay. But if that was the day you were having, it was a good idea to find a place out of sight of the kitchen so that everyone else knew that you needed some space that day. So when things were all ready for us to eat, we would pick up our own plates and we would take them to where the food was and fill our plates up with exactly what we wanted on our plate. And then we would sit at the table. When we sat at the table, it was time to eat and it was time to talk. In my family, the right way to talk, to have a conversation at the dinner table with lots of family members is to talk over and around and under and through the other conversations that are happening at the same time. And usually also while a TV is playing somewhere out of sight, but you know, not out of hearing range. So there was always lots to hear and lots of conversations to join and switch between and questions to answer. And in these conversations in my family, the right way to react when someone's words would get mixed up while they're talking is to point it out. Like when you mean to say potatoes and carrots, but your mouth says potatoes and parrots, it's really funny. And the person whose mouth made the funny moment maybe didn't hear the funny thing they said, and they should get to enjoy how funny it was with you. Now, I said this story was about culture. Why am I talking about dinner time and potatoes and parrots? Well, when I was young, my family's dinner time was the only way to do it that I knew about. It wasn't until I got a little older and went to share meals at other people's houses that I learned there were other ways for families to be together, other habits that weren't like my family's habits. In a friend's family, when I went to visit them, the right way to prepare for their dinner was to wash your hands, help set the table if you were asked, and definitely to stay out of the kitchen so the person who was cooking could concentrate and work and have lots of space so they wouldn't trip over people coming through to ask to be helpful. It wasn't helpful in their kitchen. And when it was time to eat, the right way to fill your plate was to sit down where your plate was and wait for the dishes to be passed to you. And I thought, wow, this is a completely new way to do dinner time. But the biggest surprise for me was to realize the right way to have a conversation at this table wasn't to layer them all together, woven together or stuffed like flapjacks but to have conversations where everyone talked one after the other, like train cars or beads in a necklace. And it was brand new to me that, that conversations can take other shapes. So it was a really big like, realization and maybe a little stressful in the moment when I was learning all of these new ways to be, that there could be different habits, different expectations when I was in different places. 
and a way to think about different habits and expectations and places is to call it a culture. So that was how I learned that my family had a culture and that maybe other families have their own cultures. Now, culture can be a small word and it can be a big word. It's not just family sized. Your work or your school and your classroom might have its own culture, its own habits. Your city can have a culture. The state that your city is in can have a big culture where we share some things in common. And countries, countries are a very big culture bubble. There's lots of different sizes that we're inside of at the same time. Like, boop, 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 whoa. But like a bubble, if you're inside it, seeing that culture can be tricky and wibbly wobbly. Like how when all my experiences took place inside my own family bubble, that was my entire picture. Clearly, the right way to do the things is this way the way my family does it. But right way, wrong way, that's not really how it's the best way to think about it. Our differences in our cultures, they're not as simple as right and wrong. There's no perfect necessarily. There can be like a benefit to adjusting our habits, trying out new experiences, seeing if Someone else's way of doing the thing is more interesting and maybe feels really good to do to you and you just never tried it that way before. But the difference between my friend's house and my house, it wasn't inherently about one of us needed to judge the other. It was about learning to understand myself in relation to each other, to each other and expand the awareness in a way that improves our ability to be in relationship and community with each other. And I do think the bigger that bubble of culture around us is, the harder it is to see. Like, I didn't see my small bubble until I went outside of it. And you can think of the state we're in as maybe like a medium large bubble. And I have traveled outside of it the state bubble. And when I did, I learned that other states have different driving cultures, different road habits and expectations. I visited my friend in Colorado and they had a special road that you would pay for a pass to drive on it. And if you didn't have a pass, that, that lane on the freeway, you weren't supposed to use it unless you had that pass already. So that was something I had to learn and I didn't see until I left the bubble of my state. But so how do you see a culture that you're inside of when you've never traveled outside of it or it's a bubble that's so big that maybe outside the bubble is really, really far away or maybe not even a thing you can physically go outside of. That's tricky, right? Tricky to think about. Oh, how do I get outside of a big cultural bubble to see it? Well, sometimes the answer is reading about it or hearing a friend talk about it. Someone you trust is excited to share a new idea with you. Because these bubbles of culture, they can be as invisible as, as the air inside of the bubble is, right? As invisible as water might be to a fish that's swimming. If we think of it instead of bubbles, we think of it as fish tanks. A fish doesn't necessarily know they're swimming inside of water. They can't see it. It's just, it is, it's where you are. This is how life looks here. So what we're talking about today, white supremacy culture, it might be really new to learn about thinking of it as a thing that exists, a thing that's been around us this whole time. But lucky for us, we aren't the fish. We're not 
swimming in, in literal water that we have to stay inside of. We don't have to keep swimming. We can leave the water. We can learn new ways to be together. So I'd like to end with Miss Katie's wonderful way to end together times. Everyone, please remember that you are very powerful and you are very loved.